Today, we have a really cool class because so far this semester, we've been to Mars twice. Uh, we've figured out that none of you are actually going to be driving your own cars in the future. Uh, but today, we are all about the music industry. And one of my first happy personal professional exits was, one, was from one of the early streaming media companies. So this particular area of entrepreneurship is near and dear to my heart. Um, the reason why these individuals uh, are here today is that the music industry is also unique and that I don't know any other industry that has embraced and rebuffed and embraced and rebuffed technology and changes uh, the same way the music industry has. So please let me uh, introduce our esteemed panel, and then if you would hold your applause until all of them out are out here, that would be awesome. First up is Mike Jabara, who has recently been named CEO of music tech company MQA. Mike is a U of M grad, and I consider him a friend. He joined MQA from the Warner Music Group following a 20-year tenure as a major, at the major. When he first joined WEA in the sales and retail marketing department of the company, he later ended up being named president of their, um, of their new music division, correct, Warner's Alternative Distribution Alliance. Um, but he's now got an even cooler job. Am I allowed to say that? Yes. He's going to tell us about that. Please also welcome next Justin Evans, who is the chief creative officer of Lander. Uh, Lander is a company that's doing something that... Um, I'm dying to hear more about. They've, they've got basically a product that does automated mastering. So who knows if we'll even need engineers for music in the future if Lander has their way. Um, and then I would also like you to welcome Jay Troop. Jay is the senior analyst for Next Big Sound, which is now part of the Pandora family and is a leading provider of online music analytics. In the old days, which Mike and I remember, but the rest of these guys might not, uh, how you did analytics on music was dramatically different than the way it is today. As any of you who are part of the Pandora Challenge kickoff yesterday know, um, analytics drive a lot or drive a big bus in the music business today. And finally, please welcome Jay LaBeouf, who actually helped make our whole entire Pandora Music Challenge happen. He is the executive director of Real Industry, which is an, uh, an education nonprofit that is preparing students to enter the technology industry by exposing them to leading tech companies' practices in the music business. Um, one of the companies that Jay actually works with is Lander. As an entrepreneur, Jay founded Imagine Research, which was an intelligent audio tech startup that built a search engine for sound. He's also been recognized by Bloomberg Business Week as an innovator. Uh, also consider him a friend. He's been a great friend of many of the programs at Michigan. Let's talk music. Guys, please welcome our panel today. Since I did such a nice job of butchering each of your um, introductions, it would be awesome if we could start with all of you explaining a little bit about yourselves and what you and your company do. We'll start with you, Mike. All right. Um, I'm a local native. Actually, spent my freshman year in Bursley, not that far away from where we are sitting right now. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> came out of Michigan as a mechanical engineer, and I've been able to kind of combine my personal um, and professional background in music with the engineering chops that I was able to at least begin to establish here. My current role is running um, an engineering-centered audio technology company. So I'm in the second month of my gig, as Tom pointed, I recently made a move from the Warner Music Group, where I was for about 20 years. Um, and that sounds like a long time, doesn't it, when you say it out loud? How scary is it to go from being a company guy like that to suddenly being back out there in uh, free fall land? Well, in some ways, and we'll talk about it today, I think, I was able to build some of the muscle over that 20 years that I am I'm using today. So I think it's possible to go and um, get comfortable with disruption or get comfortable with driving change when you might be the only one that believes that it's the right thing to do, even in a big corporate environment. So not as scary. I mean, it's, there is something about having to meet with the investors on a regular basis and convince them that the vision and the strategy is correct. But uh, so a little bit exciting, a little bit terrifying, but a ton of fun. And what we do um, at the core of it is we have a fundamentally different view on how all of us as humans hear. And when you line that up against what's traditionally been done, 
when analog turns into digital in the form of audio, we believe that we've got a, a different approach that's based more in um, the fundamental natural way that humans hear. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the technology really addresses all of that. Perfect. Hi, um, I'm Justin Evans. I co-founded Lander. Um, actually, it was a, it's kind of cool because it was a tech transfer initiative out of um, Queen Mary University of London. There's a cool program there called Center for Digital Music. And as an entrepreneur and as an ex-musician, um, I don't know if you can ever be an ex-musician, but as a non-active musician, um, I went there and saw that they were doing some really exciting stuff, the program there, the Center for Digital Music, on what music information retrieval and uh, machine learning could do for sound engineering tasks. And as a musician who hated mastering engineers when they wrecked my music and had some really, really big challenges with the costs of it because I made really uncommercial music, I would saw the potential of this stuff to really empower musicians in a really radical way and got really excited about it. So we took that kind of base technology, patented the heck out of it, and uh, with the help of the university, and built a product that we launched two years ago. And in that two years, we've, we've caused a massive disruption in the music industry. We, we've mastered three million songs in two years since we launched. We're mastering more songs than all the mastering houses in the world combined monthly. Um, and we're empowering musicians in an incredibly exciting way. We're actually, it's pretty exciting. We just did a big partnership with SoundCloud this a few months ago. And we are now the second biggest uh, source of music to SoundCloud after GarageBand. So was there an inflection moment when you really saw this taking off and you knew that you had lightning in a bottle, so to speak? Yeah, I think it was, it was really interesting. There were two inflection moments for me. The first was, I mean, and this will get into the path of entrepreneurialism in a neat way. Like, when you try and do something like this, it's kind of terrifying because you, you're, you're doing something no one's ever done before and you don't know if it's going to work. And you're in the process, you believe it's going to work, you have the intuition that you can get it there, you see what things like machine learning can do, but there's always this point of like, is it going to cross that line? Are we going to deliver something that the market wants? And shortly after we launched, Bob Weir from The Grateful Dead reached out and was our first big client and was a huge supporter and really excited. Their, their studio, TRI, jumped on us right away and they were unbelievable. And I was like, okay, we built something. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. And then we kept accelerating after that. So that was, that was it probably. And then I think probably when we passed the first month where we'd done, like, you know, we had this growth pattern where we were doing like a few thousand, you know, 10,000. But then when we started going from 100,000 to 200,000, you know, masters in a month, it was really like, okay, this is a really, really substantial real technology that we built. Great. Jay number one. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jay Troop uh, from Next Big Sound. And we, the, the company started, um, back, or we just had our date of birthday back in June, actually. And we've been active now for seven years. Um, but it, it basically started by, with the idea that, like, with all this being tracked on the, in, in, uh, online, with um, then it was MySpace and all this stuff, um, and one of our founders set up um, a, a, a crawler to basically count the, uh, the MySpace plays on, um, I think it was Pitbull or something like that, um, like just to see what was going on and tracked overnight um, something more like uh, tens of thousands of plays. And I uh, had been talking with some of the other founders who had worked in the music industry and were, saying, and were looking at that and saying, like, I promise you, nobody in the industry was watching that happen in real time. So how could we gather this data and then make it useful? And so that started as the, the mission of Next Big Sound uh, back then, and we've come a long way since then. We were acquired by Pandora um, last uh, su su summer, and so have now been kind of trying to incorporate all of Pandora's data into the same platform that we still use to track socials and then video streaming um, from across the, the, the web. And then we've tried to build that into a platform that not only kind of reports those numbers, though that is somewhat useful, but trying to build, act, build real context into this. Because one of the things we hear all the time when we're talking to labels and trying to market music, or we're talking to um, individual managers and the artists themselves, they have the problem of like knowing like how good is good enough. Like what, what is my next milestone? I've got 10,000 Facebook page likes, what does that actually mean? And so we've been trying to kind of um, use a great science team and then a bunch of research that we do in house to try and answer a lot of those. Okay, and at some point I wanna come back and have you talk about your acquisition experience. Um, oh, sure thing. But Jay number two. Why, thank you, Tom. Uh, 
So I wear a number of hats, but I can tie them all back to the fact that uh, when I was sitting where you are sitting right now, um, metaphorically, I went to Cornell undergrad, but I was an electrical engineer, and I was the world's unhappiest electrical engineer. I hated it. It was absolutely miserable. But what kept me sane is I was a drummer, and I was gigging out more than I was studying. I was uh, doing some, like, some touring stuff, playing with the band, um, and then one night... See if he does not endorse this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Be honest. You need the inflection point, the aha moment. I was in a recording studio, and I looked around, and I see all these blinking lights and knobs, and we were editing everything on Pro Tools, and I'm like, holy heck. People actually work on this stuff. Engineers work on this. I bet there were some startups that were behind the scenes of this, and that kind of started my whole path down the music technology, creative technology space. And so over the past 16 years, I've kind of taken that theme of, I want to be an engineer, creator, disruptor in the music and digital media technology space. And so that's kind of been the passion as I've gone through a lot of crap. Um, I've uh, run research on the uh, Pro Tools team. So Pro Tools is the kind of industry leading audio editing and mixing solution. So um, I led research there for a while. I um, did a startup that Tom mentioned called Imagine Research, which was, I would say, the first machine listening applied to music and audio company. Um, Pandora was actually a, a consulting client of ours in 2008. Um, that company was acquired in 2012. Fantastic and interesting experience in and of itself. Um, I worked for the acquiring company, Isotope, um, who's an amazing company. I worked for them in the CTO role for a few years. Um, and now I'm taking on a role as kind of an, an educator and facilitator uh, because I look, at, um, you know, I look at you guys and wanting to get involved, perhaps, in the music and digital media tech industry. And um, so my goal is to bring amazing companies like Lander and Pandora and Sonos and Warner um, and Dolby and DTS, like two companies uh, and two universities. So um, I'm actually thrilled one of my hats will be as a lecturer uh, in the winter teaching here. He's a good lecturer. Please take his class. Um, you guys know that we're reading um, Reed Hoffman's book, The Startup of You. And so with a nod to this week's reading, a question for all of you is, what are some methods that you guys use to gain a competitive advantage? For MQA, the product itself is based on what is now uh, registered and protected IP. So it's um, not, while spiritually we believe that the goal of any technology company in the music space is to try to take the artist performance from an analog performance, since everything starts that way, and allow the consumer to enjoy it as an analog, analog experience without any loss in between, we attack that along the way. And so our differentiation um, first starts with it, but like I think any great idea, and it wasn't mine by the way, my partner is the med scientist in the exercise, I'm the guy that's supposed to build the business out of it, but um, we also focus a lot on the operational execution. And so I think great idea powered by actual execution is what will make any company unique and different and successful, but it does help to have something like protected technology along the way. I think that there's some really, uh, the concept of product market fit and disruption is really key to think about with this and first mover advantage. So we saw, um, and, and IP, because we're, this is, it's really important the IP piece because that's what protects you after you've built the market. But we saw, I, I came from two lives of being a musician and also being a web guy who'd had some experience with building products, online products before. And when I saw, what they were doing was, and, you know, you're seeing machine learning changing the world everywhere and not changing music. And knowing that if we could be the people, it, you guys had already done stuff, you know, people in your space with the data analytics, but actually music production or music creation, there was nobody doing anything with it in that space. And this is like a, an incredible moment for an entrepreneur when you see something like that and you're positioned to see those two kind of aligning forces and go, huh. We could be the first person there, and we could do that. And, and it was really like a bolt out of the blue of being able to go like, okay, that is going to happen. It is inevitable. And if we get to the market first and protect ourselves, we have an incredible, incredible position to operate from. Is there anybody that you consider a competitor right now in the space, even if you were first to market? 
It's interesting. There's a lot of um, we joke about knockoffs, like because the interface is really, really simple. There's a whole bunch of people that have put stuff. Like there's mimic. There, there's actually somebody who actually stole our actual images from our website and made a website in like India that was like this is this is some other service that does this. Um, the, the reality is the, the hardest part of what we do is the MIR, is the music information retrieval part, because you have to treat a song that is um, a country music song, for example, different than a rap song. Or, and that gets more and more nuanced the more, that, the more data that you have and the more genres of music you have. We have protected the heck out of that. And so every kind of imitator that's emerged in the market since really can't go down that road, so we're pretty well protected, and, and the results generally are pretty great. So this might be a naive question, and yeah. I'll apologize in advance, but yeah. you know, the creation of music is a highly personal, intimate experience. Okay, well then, it sounds like I'm throwing you a softball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, mentioned the, you mentioned the simplicity of your UI, which yeah. obviously would be important, but how do you reconcile, or how do you as, a, as an artist, I mean, clearly you saw a problem that you wanted to fix, which is what drove you to do this in the first place. Yeah. But if I'm just sitting in the coffee house, strumming on my guitar, how do you not make me feel like machine learning technology is not is going to crush the spirit or the essence of what I'm trying to create? So there's like so many different ways to tackle that question. The first is who uses Lander, right? It's interesting that you bring up the guy with the acoustic guitar in the coffee house. I can guarantee you that that guy with the acoustic guitar in the coffee house really hates trying to operate a compressor. You know, they're completely different, which is one of the tools you use in a mastering chain. So for many of those people that don't, I mean, Bob Weir is a great example of someone that adopted the technology early. You, you want to be a great songwriter. You want, to, you want to play your guitar better. Why should you need to learn, as Jay said, this great weird piece of machinery with all these knobs and dials that are hyper complex? So the ease of use and the simplicity has made a lot of people get it better. The people that resist that from a kind of ideological perspective or from a, which we definitely, man, when we launched, we had people, I had death threats, we had someone offer to pee on me in our support forums, like, the, there was a lot of, like, there was a lot of anger. Okay, that'll be the pull quote for marketing the class <laughs> next semester. Everybody was here. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of anger towards Lander when it first emerged. For I guess those, so. For those reasons, but, the thing that's really interesting is the proofs in the pudding. Like, and I, I also come from a really big e-com background and the experience funnel that you give people, what do you do when you go to Lander? You hear your song. Before you do anything, before you sign up for an account, you put your, you're that guy with a guitar, you put your song on the website, you literally drag and drop it onto the website and in a very short amount of time later you hear how much better Lander makes it sound. And I can guarantee you that for like 80% of the people, Lander's going to do a better job than what they could do by themselves, or often better than the people they're working with can do. So you, we're really generous with giving that to the user, and they're like, wow, this is amazing. Interestingly, too, is the other side of t attacking that question is that what genres have adopted? It, it, plurality of users is a really interesting thing to think about. There's different people with different needs. A acoustic uh, guitar person who's going to want to go work at uh, welcome to 1979, which is an amazing all analog studio in Nashville that I really love. Chris is an amazing guy that runs that. He has all analog tape machines. He has a like vinyl lathe. It's like perfect. It's amazing. The guy who's going to go there is not probably going to want to use Lander so much, but because they're really excited about this purist idea of a certain era of recording and a certain, which I love totally. I love what you're talking about with the analog through digital, and I think that there's ways that we can address those questions. Well, hang on, because I want to, so let, let me put a pause on you for a sec, yeah. though. So, given the fact that you both are quality plays, how many different technologies or layers of technology do you need, and are you two competitors, or are your offerings potentially collaborative? I'm going to let you answer that. <laughs> At some point, while this is not a statement of a commercial relationship. Just because Justin and I have been talking about Lander for a few years now, in my Warner life, um, we were engaged in, in some discussions. I think that a technology like ours would be a natural plug-in to the Lander platform. Um, tremendous distributed self-serve um, capabilities that Lander brings, and I'm sure they'll have partners with a lot of additional technologies that will complement or supplement what they're doing. 
Perfect. All right, now we know it's going to sound amazing. Talk to me a little bit about how the data analytics are going to either drive users, awareness, artist creation. How do you fit into this chain? Um, yeah, it's an interesting, yeah, we, we've, the J's got mic'd. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's. Um, I was also thinking about the uh, the uh, the competition question you had, and it's interesting to think about how to answer that both as Next Big Sound and now as Pandora. And okay, wait, um, stop there for a sec, though. Yeah, talk then a little bit about the acquisition experience and oh, how okay. you feel being sort of like medium fish getting eaten by bigger fish, and uh -huh. were you looking to be acquired, and and then roll into the competitive piece of that. Yeah, okay. Um, well, we were and are a team of under 25 people. Um, and we had built ourselves as kind of a very mission-driven and neutral um, data platform in the music industry. We had um, worked or were working with all three major labels. We were working with um, most of the major management companies. Um, we were used by um, thousands of individual managers and artists. And we had a relationship with Spotify and with SoundCloud. And we had Apple Music data. And we had Shazam data. And we had all social data. And it was kind of this one place where we could sit as an independent company um, and, and watch it all pour in and then, and then create this awesome dashboard. And so like, when we were trying to, to pitch that to people, you know, there was only really one place that had the, the awesome archive that we had. We had had years worth of data. We had been watching every single video on, on Vivo, every um, music video on, on, on YouTube, hundreds of thousands of artists. And so it's actually very easy to kind of say that we're the only ones who had that. We're in, you know, you, you should come and work with us. It'll make your life trying to market music, trying to understand this industry a lot easier. Um, since being acquired um, by Pam, 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 Pandora, uh, a lot of things have changed. Uh, we no longer um, have, have a par partnership with SoundCloud or Spotify for obvious and understandable reasons. Um, but needed to then kind of think, but part of the challenge when we were independent is how do you monetize that? Because we, you know, we didn't want to be charging an arm, uh, an arm and a leg to every person who's trying to build their fan base from nothing in their bedroom. But if you're going to be working with the major labels, you really, it's best to have a business that has um, a user base of more than three clients. Um, if you only have three clients, things, you get those deals signed and it's, you feel great and then it's like, okay, well, what's next? Um, and growth is, is then a really hard, um, hard challenge. So we, we had branched out into next to big book. Was this something that we were looking at? And how can we do the same thing with, uh, with books? And we were trying to, we were thinking about TV and film and, and it just, you get spread really thin. Um, so since being bought, yeah, being bought by a big fish, it, like it at first is very uncomfortable. It's hard to know how that's going to go because we're only a certain number of people. And we had watched competitors or partners in the space um, like Echo Nest and um, some of the other kind of music data companies get bought up and um, bought by Spotify, bought by Apple. And some of those just kind of closed their doors and you didn't really hear from them again. Some of them you didn't hear from them for a while. And then they started to like, Spotify has got some great data stuff that they started to roll out in the last couple of years, both for ads and then like now emails and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's been awesome to, to, to see. But it, there's a lot of unknown. And once you've been acquired, you've been acquired, and that's kind of it. And it's just a wait and see. Um, so far, it's been awesome. And it's been awesome for a number of reasons. They, they have given us a ton of autonomy um, to continue to work on the things that we're excited about. Um, we work on what we want to. And um, there is, has not been a lot of like, OK, now, now you guys do this. Um, and they let us retain our own, in our own separate branding and our own um, separate relationships with clients. Um, but then the exciting part of being acquired by a company that is now, like, I think, 23, 2,400 people and um, has over a billion dollars coming in the door every year um, is that it lets us scale up and lets us scale up to in a huge ways and all of a sudden access. Um, not only all the musicians that are spinning on the platform, but all of those listeners and try and make life better for all those people. So it let us increase the idea of our mandate in, in a huge way. And now like, we had to like, change the way we thought of ourselves and the way we thought about data because um, we're no longer like the single source for the entire industry. Um, but in terms of social and video streaming, we still are. And then we've also now got this great Pandora data. And so I think now we've focused in on, to get back to your, your, your first question there, we focused in on like, so what does all this data actually mean and how can we make this context useful? 
And it really comes down to whether you're an artist or a label or a publisher or a fan, it comes down to what what the data is actually trying to get at, which is what music is really landing with people. What music do people really care about? Are people getting excited about? Are they sharing with their friends? Do they want to hear all the time? And whether it's just like hitting replay on Pandora until you're out of them, or whether that's like binge listening to something on uh, Spotify or SoundCloud, or buying tickets to the show, or buying tickets to several shows, like th that conversation of what it is to be a fan, what it is to be a listener first and then what it is to be a fan, is at the heart of what music needs to solve because that's what artists need. But you don't worry that. that that's going to compromise the creative process at some point where it's like, oh, you're going to need a hook that sounds like this because these hooks get like X, Y more plays than whatever you just delivered to me in an incredibly automated, awesome, mastered form. So, like, I, I, I'm not worried about that. There is certainly going to be some of that. I think there's been some of that since the 1940s. You've had song, like, factories that just turn out, like, the same four songs. Like, you, you listen to um, a song like, um, you, you be, 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 be long to, to me, pardon my stutter, um, which was a number one hit for like three or four different people in the span of two or three years. And it's Patsy Klein and it's Bob Dylan and it's you know, a bunch of people. Like, th that, kind of, that kind of thing isn't new. But making music can still be art. Selling it doesn't have to be. Like, at the end of the day, like, a musician, the artistry of a musician is going to be making their product, ma like, crafting their show, connecting with their fans when they get the opportunity. But you don't need to make an art out of finding out who those fans are or finding out where those fans are. Because if you have an effective line directly to your fans, you have more resources and more ability and more time to actually build an experience that lets you connect with them. Fair enough. Can I ask you a, a hang on one sec. Um, the competitive question from a different perspective, with all the different companies that you've worked with, are there any that stick in your head as like shoulda, woulda, couldas, or people that were maybe on to something too early, or made a fatal decision too late? Um, well, okay, I'll say I was on to something too early, and I now realize, like, in, I mean, in 2000 and five, we were working on like trying to, trying to integrate machine learning into the recording studio with my hypothesis being nobody really wants to do this complicated stuff because if you have that time back, if you're a musician, you're the, you're the, you're the guitarist um, you know, in the uh, coffee shop, you go home, you pull up Logic, you set up a mic, there's feedback, it sounds like crap. Like, you just want to get your song out there to the world and get everybody else listening to it and start getting some like thumbs up and know where to play. That's actually what you want. So I looked at it from a, hey, there, there is an art form to audio engineering. Can we automate that for the people that just don't want to have to deal with that? Or for the people that make their living doing that, can we remove the mundane stuff? I mean, if you're a top engineer or producer, you have an intern come in and kind of set things up for you. So can we automate that? Um, the reason that I am like so proud to be aligned with Lander is because they're doing it now when the market is actually ready for uh, machine learning to take care of their audio. The, the market was not ready for it then. The company I worked for was not ready for it then. Um, to uh, to talk about you know the the thing that has been going really well, and I would say through every company I've ever worked with. The one thing that has been the biggest competitive advantage for that company and for me has been relationships. I mean, this is a music panel, so I feel like I need to be the first one to talk about relationships. Uh, but that is the lifeblood. I feel like more than any other industry, it's the lifeblood of our industry, but also within, within being an entrepreneur. Um, the ability to network your way to get casual coffee feedback from an angel, to sit down and you know talk to industry folks and get feedback on your ideas. Um, I have curated my network and my distribution channels more than anything, and it pays off in spades. All right, but you feed me two things back to you, which are that the labels historically fought the arrival of technology, and good news, we're here to save you for a real long time, yes? I don't think they fought it. I think they were napping. Um, the industry 
made a lot of money and got slow and fat and dumb while counting that money from all the shiny disks that they had sold. And so the industry had a history of imposing technology and experiences on consumers for a very long time, had a great run, kind of lost touch with what consumers were doing, and were intermediated by people that were paying attention or creating new behaviors. And so the industry was now reacting to technologies that had been put in place while they were on vacation. And so I don't think the depiction of the industry as fighting it was so much as, oh crap, now we need to get really smart fast about something, and we have none of the skills in the building right now to deal with it. So it probably felt like resistance because it was an inability to act on that new reality. And, and probably evidence of how desperate, I would say, the industry was is that Steve Jobs and iTunes looked like a savior by being the first that was willing to charge for the music as opposed to the free peer-to-peer -peer acquisition model. However, it totally deconstructed the economics of the music industry because it took what was a controlled album format driven high margin business into a deconstructed singles business. The overhead, the margins, and even the musical process for creating records got changed overnight. And so when they said yes to the 99 cent single, they were saying goodbye to, oh crap, we can't charge $10 for anything anymore. People can choose to only spend a buck. And the industry wasn't organized that way. But if you and Justin are going to make my stuff sound awesome and you're going to tell me um, where to find my fans, will I need the labels? What, what are the labels going to look like in 10 years? What is it going to be their value at? Anybody? I have a, a view that anybody that wants to have a career, rather that, whether it's a superstar career or a... Um, you know, middle-class sustainable artist career does have more responsibility to today to decide what they want their lifestyle to be. So DIY too easily, I think, gets turned into a discussion around technologies for self-distribution or self-creation or self-publication. It's really not that. The DIY is how do I want the revenue generating part of my career to fit with everything else that I want to do in my life? And then who do I need to include in my circle professionally in order to achieve that? You probably could make an argument that today's music industry, at least the one that's seen as the mainstream with the three major labels, mm -hmm. is only appealing to a very narrow channel of consumer and certainly a very narrow channel of consumption, <laughs> right? With streaming emerging now as the dominant consumption behavior, largely portable, passive, while I'm doing other stuff. That's not the only way that people make money in the music industry or the way artists need to, right? Live performance has always been a massive part of the overall revenue stream. And so I think... Um, the, the ability for people to define a path that fits their life is upon us right now. That's why something like Lander is so exciting. Right? I can have control over that production process in a way that I haven't before. You are getting a lot of love up here. It's nice. Uh, yeah. Man, I'm used to it. Like, when we launched, it was all hate. So this is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not for me. Not for no, me. Really no, you're always great. No, you're always great. Yeah. Like you said yeah. earlier, I Can I just real quickly, and I know Justin's going to jump yeah. in, but I want to take you back time real quickly to the acquisition question that you asked Jay earlier. Right. And that's yeah. for you guys in the room. One of the things that Next Big Sound did incredibly well pre- and post-acquisition by a really big company called Pandora was they didn't forget about their existing clients. So Alex White, one of the founders of the company, somebody that we've, a lot of us known for a long time, we went from a Wednesday before the deal that none of us knew was happening to the Wednesday after we had recurring meetings because we were implementing some new stuff at Warner and the team didn't miss a beat. And a lot of stuff happened overnight for that team. And a lot could have happened probably to Next Big Sound and even to Pandora's reputation had they not been so attentive to the people that got them there. So as you're all thinking about the businesses that you either want to build or the ones that you're watching, those relationships, going back to what the other Jay was saying, is, are really critical. But finding a way during that transaction to stay focused on the partners that were part of building the company is really critical. And it reflected very positively from the music industry label side on Pandora, the acquirer, as well as the team at Next Big Sound. So Thank Justin, you. Um, you make some bold claims about being able to ultimately replace all mastering engineers. I never said that. Well, no. Nope. <laughs> no, we don't. Lander. People talk. People talk about us. People put that at us. We have never said that in any publication, any any interview, anything we've ever done. That's never been part of our material, and it speaks really directly to what the the data question that I was dying to get in on earlier about backwards engineering a song from the kind of data that these guys produce. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Like we get one of the the most angry questions I always get is isn't this going to just flatten out sound engineering? Aren't you just making something predictable and boring? And mm -hmm. the reality is, is, is it's the opposite. 
both if people already are writing songs that way they have been forever since like the 1940s I sat in an amazing panel with an amazing producer who was talking about how he took a sample from a big pun song specifically because it was 14 years difference from today and that kids would have grown up with that when they were little kids with their parents listening to it and he made one of the biggest hit songs of the year out of it specifically thinking about the data like you know he's not using data but he's using data same thing with what we do. The thing that's really exciting to me is that we're just giving people better tools to do those kinds of things. And innovation will always happen around them. The data that, that if people use to create songs from what you guys do, it's like a new toolkit. It's a new creative toolkit for people. When people use Lander, they dump something in it, they get a master, and what do they do? They go and work on their mix and change their mix and then put it back into Lander. And they're using Lander as a creative tool. And with all these kind of great advancements with data tools and stuff, humans are way too cool and way too interesting and way too, uh, what's the word? Um, people, people are creative and in a great destructive way. And any tool like ours that comes out are going to, people are going to use it in a totally wacky, awesome way that totally changes music. And I can't wait for us to get disrupted. You know, and this is just the history of disruption. So what companies in this space are each of you most excited about other than your own and Lander, because we've talked about Lander a lot today, um, right now? We'll start over here with you this time, Jay. <sighs> companies that are most exciting in the space. There's... And why? And why? I got to whittle my list down. Somebody else want to go first? Um, I'm just, I'll just jump out with something. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a tough one. But what I've been focusing on mostly in the last couple of weeks is thinking about how we can bring experimentation and real experimentation into the music industry and into music marketing. Um, and because that's something that now tech startups will do, you can A-B test a button and you can A-B test a user onboarding and you can A-B test a lot of things now, but there's not a lot of that going on in the music industry. And uh, looking around, you can, it's easy to see why. Like it's, the risks are so high. It costs so much money to market. Um, a, a single, it costs so much money to make a single that um, you usually want to throw everything at the wall and just see what sticks. Um, but uh, uh, there's... You, a okay, hang on. Do you think that that cost will go down as technology becomes more sophisticated and tends to drive other cost structures lower? Well, uh, that cost comes from a lot of places, right? And one of the, the primary places that costs now is, is, is marketing. Right. Like, people can't love a song if they've never heard a song. And if there are 40 million songs in the Spotify catalog, and there are 30 million songs or 40 million songs spinning on a service like Pandora and SoundCloud, like how is your song going to get the audience versus something else? And so that's, that's like more and more you're seeing if you're looking at the way record labels are spending money, that marketing piece is a huge amount of, of what they're spending it on. Um, and also, there's always, there are always going to be creators who want to work with tape. And there are always going to be creators that want to work with that stuff, and that stuff costs. Um, but so I, I was recently talking with a music marketing company called M Theory, um, which do really interesting work. Um, but I loved hearing their process when they sit down with an artist, which is to sit down and do a business analysis of where that artist makes their money. And sit down like, okay, you make 25% of your revenue from record sales, you're making this percentage from streaming, this, this per, 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 per percentage from live, and then build a business plan that treats that like it were a real business. Like, okay, you're not making any money on Spotify, but you've got an audience of more than eight million people there. Um, okay, let's try and juice that and use that as basically a loss leader and pour a bunch of money into it, not expecting to ever make money back from streaming, but to use that to then take to festivals across the country and say like, hey, you really should have this headline in your festival, look at how many millions of Americans are listening to my track, and then say like, okay, well, thank you very much for the $150,000 guarantee, um, where it's, I don't have to sell any tickets and I don't have to do anything, so all of a sudden I've like got all these festival dates, and then I'm going to line up a, a couple um, hundred thousand tickets after that, do a worldwide tour, and all of a sudden you've got something that really makes sense. And so I, I love to see companies beginning to do that, but then they're also beginning to test marketing strategies and get really smart. I was talking about a, a marketing strategy they did recently to sell 60,000 tickets in the United States. That's it. Not North America, just the United States. And they rolled out a 10-country marketing plan for that. 
because you're, they're being smart about using the platforms that they're working on. And in this case, Spotify. If you wind up going viral or having like a ton of play and a ton of listenership that's spreading in Mexico City and in Canada and in the Netherlands and in Germany, guess what? It pops up on things like the Spotify Viral 50. It pops up on these, these playlists that then let you branch into the United States and all of a sudden get a huge listenership in the United States. And those numbers are so valuable, that audience growth is so valuable, they wound up overselling their their tour by like 50% and added a bunch of dates and all this stuff. But it, it takes a lot of experimentation and testing to be able to adapt. Um, and so you, we have to, it's, it's a weird world, but we've got to like be able to experiment. And to, to do that, the company needs to be willing to fail. And that's something that every business needs to be smart about, but you really have to be willing. And when you're first laying this out, like we're going to put this much money into this marketing plan and maybe it's not going to work. And, and talking every, I've had this conversation all summer and three times of four that I have the conversation and I say like, okay, but when you were thinking about trying to sell tickets for this tour, did you test different marketing strategies to try and get people to, to click on that buy link? Because I mean, that's mostly a marketing challenge, right? You're trying to get people to, to go and click on a link to buy a ticket to come to a show. And three times out of four, the answer was no. And that's just the, the industry just won't, like for, something like 40% of tickets go unsold um, in, in this kind of mid-tier of the people playing rock clubs, the, the, the bands like Wolfpack and Tally Hall. So there's Tally a business Hall, opportunity so, for that, everybody who's listening, right? Well, Ticketfly, uh, which Pandora also <laughs> acquired, has been really trying to do that. And Pandora is actually one of the tools of Pandora we uh, have been testing all year and are about to take on the road um, in a really big way. Um, it has been to try and get a, a really seamless ticket buying experience to a listener of the track when you're doing it. Not when you're on Facebook, not when you're on YouTube, not when you're at your desk, but when you're hearing their music and you just want to go thumb it up and say like, oh, I love this song. And it's like, oh, by the way, they're, they're playing by you in three weeks. And trying to surface those kinds of tools. But right now, it's hard. There are not a lot of easy ways to do that. These poor guys hear about failing every single week. So I'm going to start referring to this as the, if you don't fail, you're, yeah, you're yeah. the failure class. Totally. Yeah. Uh, did you come up with a company that you uh, are super psyched about? I did. I had to decide between a VR company and a hardware company. I'm going hardware. And the reason why, um, quick show of hands, raise your hands if you use earbuds. Exactly. So um, there's projections. It's going to the, the market for earbuds and uh, headphones is going to 17 billion dollars by 2021. So it's this. It's a universal. All of you guys are probably going to buy wireless earbuds at some point and think of these things that used to dangle down as like uh, back in my day. You know, I had these cables. Uh, so it's a company called Doppler Labs. Uh -huh. um, now, after Apple announced the, uh, the AirPods, EarPods, the, I mean, they look slick. A, they, look, <laughs> they look like, OK, I mean, you'd think you'd be foolish to compete against Apple. But they've actually had, they've been doing wireless earbuds for about 18 months before that. And because it's a hardware product, it means they actually were doing it an additional year before that but to get everything ramped up to manufacturing. So they have the expertise. They have a ton of smart algorithm folks who are not just being like, hey, my phone's in my pocket. Let's stream audio to my earbuds, but actually giving the earbuds something else to do, you know, giving it superhuman hearing. So that way, if I am, you know, need to concentrate on speech intelligibility, it'll focus on you. If I'm riding a bike, it will mute if a siren is coming by. Like these are, you know, the ability to, to give advanced functionality. Is there anybody you guys love? Other companies? I'm watching a category because um, I know our company wants it, needs it, and it's in short supply, which is experts in experience design. I think as engineers, and I, I know there's some in the room, um, and I'm a Michigan engineer, we can sometimes allow the technology to become synonymous with the experience, and they're not, right? Streaming is not actually a product, and yet we refer to that entire revenue stream as streaming. It's just a capability that's been enabled which means you don't have to cash if you don't want to, right? But we haven't really innovated around the power of having that capability. And so people that are thinking about consumer experiences and even the full product experience are in short supply and I think have great opportunity in front of them. I've seen some uh, really far out stuff with people I know that come to me and, and talk to me about their ideas. And some of the most exciting things I've seen that is really transformative is people that are taking biometrics and body stuff mm -hmm. and syncing it with music creation. 
So imagine, and I've seen people do this with song lyric content, like actual songs where you're jogging and the music is being generated by your body, like effectively your, your pulse and your, you know, whatever else it's measuring is gonna alter the actual music and co-create the music with you as you're moving. That to me is science fiction-y a bit, but it's like, I think it has the potential to be extremely transformative and really interesting. On a way more grounded level, um, I think the kind of work that people like Mike are doing, we've, we've been on this horrible trajectory. As a person that loves sound and loves the sound of an acoustic instrument, whatever, you know, like it's, it's sitting beside a piano and sticking your head in the opening and, and then hearing it on an earbud or on an iPhone speaker, which is how most people listen to music. Thank God they finally put two speakers on the damn thing. Um, you know, like li listening, yeah. we've been on an absolute nosedive in terms of sound quality and it makes sense portability, accessibility, all these things, like, you know, it's, it's a cycle. But I think there's a bunch of companies right now that are moving to making music sound great again. And as someone that really, really loves music, that's tremendously exciting to me. Guys, this hour went by too fast. In fact, class is over. Very quickly, if I could ask you, um, my dear late boss, Dick Clark, said music is the soundtrack of your life. Is there a song that you feel is part of the soundtrack of your life? And what advice might you give um, an emerging entrepreneur? Very quickly. Um, soundtrack of my life would be uh, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, because failure is imperative. Try hard, and uh, you'll succeed. Perfect. Jay? I, I can't get away from Abbey Road. Abbey Road. Yeah. OK. Any advice? Any songs? I got Space is the Place by Sun Ra and uh, fail really fast, guys. <laughs> yeah. Last word. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Big round of applause. He's a pretty successful guy, right? He's an entrepreneur. He started dozens of companies. He started nine companies that have over a billion dollar valuation. I think he's earned a chance to go to space. He went out looking for someone to sell him a ticket in the 1990s and discovered, at least back then, there wasn't anyone. So he went out looking for a technology that could carry